All right. So the first uh, point is nothing to do with finance as such, but a general point about program. You remember what is an elegant proof in mathematics in school? You don't remember this concept of an elegant proof? Okay, or a more efficient proof. So if you do, a, you know proofs, right? Yes. So if you do a proof like recently, a Cornell professor, uh, the Indian guy actually, Kaushik Basu, he was used to be chief economic advisor. He came up with a really long proof of the Pythagoras theorem. Okay. So uh, unnecessarily uh, inefficient. He came up with. He was trying to come up with the longest proof or something like that. Okay. So the point is that if you do a proof in say let's say 17 steps, and if I can do the same proof if it says that says six steps then my proof is more elegant that's what we say in mathematics okay we say this is a more elegant proof because i have proved the same thing in fewer steps okay so efficiency it has a lot of connections to important ideas in uh, in uh, in the philosophy of science and philosophy in general which we should write down as well but these are important ideas it may be a little difficult to grasp initially but um, where are we in terms of date we discussed a little bit about Vega versus exp expiration yesterday. Where is the date here? Yeah, I put the 1510 here, and yesterday was the 21st class, which is where we covered a little bit of Vega versus expiration. So we put this, we covered a lot of other things which are not in the notes, okay, which we see. I can't even see anything here. 21 this is yesterday was 2110 right so we covered vega versus expiration and today we will cover before i go into this topic i just want to start for today these are important ideas you should be because you're an mba student you're not just somebody so since you've done a master's degree in business you're required to be familiar with these kinds of ideas okay these kinds of ways of approaching things thinking abstract in the abstract about about various problems okay so the point that we are discussing now okay so it will be highlighted here so the point is the concept of an elegant proof in mathematics now you understand what is elegant proof okay that is considered a more elegant proof okay so this is also connected to the idea of um, you can read up on this later on I'll just explain briefly what this idea is so it is also loosely connected to this idea in philosophy very important principle called, and it's very useful in life as, as well okay this principle is called Occam's razor it's actually there was a guy called William of Occam in, in England okay so I don't know why the razor came up but the principle here is that basically the idea here is um, it's it's got many kinds of forms okay uh, or let's say assumptions uh, where did this go why did it jump up okay I think this this uh, display is too big if I make it 105 can you still read at the back you can read okay so this is a very crude way of writing it I'll come up with a better way uh, things should not be uh, multiplied beyond so later on I'll try to rewrite this uh, beyond necessity okay. so can you see how the ideas are connected that I proved the same thing in seven steps okay uh, or six steps and you prove you took 17 steps to prove the same thing so my proof is much more elegant because the same job can be done and if you can do it in fewer steps obviously so it's not only more elegant it's also what we would say you can see clearly there is a normative preference so it is not just to say that it's elegant obviously elegant is a nice word okay so uh, therefore uh, what what there is also in, embedded in this idea of a more elegant proof is that there is a normative uh, judgment happening that a more elegant proof is preferable to a more to a less elegant proof are you understanding that as well right so if you do a proof in 17 steps and somebody else does a step proof same proof in seven steps that person should get more marks so his proof is better so there's a normative judgment remember normative versus positive we are actually making a statement that your statement your proof is better it's a higher quality proof because it has fewer steps 
Is this clear? So you've learned this new term, elegant proof in mathematics. Okay. So can you see also the idea behind Occam's razor? Let me explain this a little bit more. Things should not be multiplied beyond necessity. Can you see already? Because if you did a proof with 17 steps, that means clearly 10 of those steps are unnecessary. Okay. Because you could have done the same steps uh, proof in seven steps. Okay. So this is a very important principle. And it's it's actually from philosophy, but you can see applications everywhere. So wherever, so you can if you can establish something with uh, but maybe with three or four premises okay why should you use you know 17 premises to establish that same point right it makes sense to everybody so it's always better to be lean you understand the concept of lean lean we say somebody who is no, very, uh, very high serious. fat and you know he's not very lean right so fat so when we are when we were taught English in school we were no, taught to like we were taught to write lean muscular prose which means don't uh, like unnecessarily use words you know which are falling over themselves so you establish the point in very clear and simple language and in, in, in very basic uh, and uh, minimalistic terms okay so the expression that was taught to us was lean muscular prose which is uh, you know few words and express the idea in a few as few words of, as possible okay so this is the idea that is there in Occam's razor that you basically don't make if you are trying to prove something you don't you only look for those assumptions that are absolutely necessary to establish that proof you do not unnecessarily make assumptions, you know, like it's a way, in a way, in an unrelated way. You should see many of the forms that you see in government offices in India, and not just government offices, even private sector does this. People, when they're designing a form, they'll just put everything, you know, whatever you want. I mean, they'll just ask for everything. But some, nobody has ever stopped to think that what is the purpose of this form and what is the bare minimum information we need to establish to achieve that purpose. Okay, so similar ideas. Okay, so this is the idea behind Occam's razor that when you are evaluating any kind of scheme or design is it does it have superfluous elements does it have elements which are not necessary to the proof okay are you getting the idea okay remember the similar concept when we discussed in uh, the connection to ratio decidendi now you've forgotten everything about your lab course yes. when we discuss ratio decidendi do you remember that I mentioned something who remembers what is the ratio decidendi of the case yeah, the logic behind the judgment. Okay. Now, if you want to make that even more specific and make that definition even more correct, okay, it is absolutely the bare minimum logic that was necessary to arrive at that decision. Okay. So the judge may have actually said certain things in the course of giving his decision, which actually, if you really analyze it from a mathematical, from a logical point of view, those statements are not necessary to arrive at the conclusion. Okay, so are you following what I'm saying? Okay, we can give some examples also, but this is the point. So the ratio decidendi, can you see once again that this is a similar idea? That everywhere we are coming to the idea of only what is necessary. That is the idea we are coming to only what is absolutely necessary to get it done. So these are important ideas when you are looking at somebody doing a design of a particular product or there's some engine or some some kind of proof or you look look for uh, are they are they actually putting forth assumptions which are not necessary for that proof. Those assumptions are superfluous. If you train yourself to think that way, it will make you uh, smarter. Okay, if I might use that word. Okay, so so this is the same idea connected also to a similar idea in ratio decidendi. Ratio decidendi is the absolute bare minimum logic that is required to arrive at the decision for the case. Not necessarily what the judge said. Okay, so the judge may be giving a ruling in favor of somebody because of some particular legal point. And then he might say, oh, but he is also a model citizen. He has been very good in the past. But that's not necessary for that decision. Okay, so that's that's the point that you're arriving at. So Occam's razor, it's also connected to elegant proof in mathematics. And similarly, when you're ma programming is a very mathematical kind of uh, discipline. Okay, this is very logical. Okay, so when you're doing programming and remember everybody has to think like a programmer because in today's age if you're not uh, you know if you don't have any understanding of technology that's why I've told everybody to try and put yourself through a basic programming course the MIT if you go to the OCW I've sent you that spreadsheet which has all the portals okay if you go to the MIT website MIT has a starting course in Python okay when you're taking co when you're doing all these courses it's very important to use pedigree sources 
okay if you're doing a course on programming try to see if you can do it from uc berkeley or no, stanford okay, you have all these courses on the standard. internet you have the stanford java programming courses on youtube at least okay it's on itunes also okay go there if you can access itunes so please be careful about using pedigree sources okay some chacha bachi jaye kone mein dukaan laga ke bech raha hai don't you know don't be careful when you are doing a course on programming i would always go first to the mit introductory course on programming okay they have a course on where they teach you how to use python they give you all the course materials try to look for the youtube videos go to itunes many of them have stuff on itunes which is not there on youtube okay so always go for do stats courses from uc berkeley top university top engineering universities like caltech okay all these courses on programming and this so make sure you do it from good quality university now because of moocs you have the access okay do i would suggest everybody go and do that mit course on python you are not expected to become a hardcore programmer who is going to get hired by facebook at you know for 200000 dollars yeah we are being taught python you are already being taught i'm saying uh, i'm just giving an example so in this case you are already being taught but there's no harm also uh, checking at looking up that course no harm looking at them point i'm trying to uh, tell you is be careful about going to pedigree sources now that you have moocs i've given you the portals okay you have access to all these uh, top courses from top university and you know what the top university are right i don't have to tell you that stanford and caltech are top engineering schools mit is the top engineering i don't need to tell you that right so when you are doing these courses do it from pedigree sources you can access the materials okay so programming also is connected to this now what is the point this whole discussion started with yes what happened what is the problem you have a question sir bottle the bottle here yeah it's the one like oh okay okay so there's a glass bottle okay all right okay guys now let's get back to programming let's get back to programming so this whole thing started you might seem at the end of the day you might uh, it might seem to you that i have may uh, done like uh, shakespeare and play much ado about nothing okay but this these things are important how to think about how to think about programming how to think about uh, because everybody has, should be aware now that especially if you are going to be a finance student you should have a good understanding of programming okay you don't have to be an expert but you should know how it works okay do some courses at least i'll give you a few a feel for how it works okay that's what is important okay so here what is saying now you can write the spreadsheet now eventually there will be formulas last year last term also i rewrote my formulas okay now what are you doing you're doing a and p the the suggested let's call it method 1 method 1 is where you enter both a's and p's okay and method 2 is what i'm following what am i doing i'm doing only a's i'm not entering p's so if it's not a then it's p okay of course we have al and all that we can deal with that later but let's take a simple scenario so which is more efficient because you have to take a systemic view so it's not just person who is using when you're designing the form it doesn't make a difference to you if you are a bureaucrat designing a form you can always ask for everything okay uh, but it doesn't it doesn't really affect you but it affects the users because you're asking them unnecessary to fill in all the kinds of information which is not necessary for the form okay but people don't apply to their mind to all these things so you have to do a when you're using when you're designing a pro writing a program not only do you have to think about the operational efficiency of the program how lean is the code remember always occam's razor elegant proofs how lean is the code can you get the task done with fewer lines of code you have to think about that it's the same idea can you see that can you see that it's the same idea as what i explained in occam's razor elegant proof is that clear to everybody right so therefore which is more efficient now method 1 or method 2 method 2 has only a's and method 2 yes method 2 is more efficient from a user perspective because total number of keystrokes is reduced okay now what have they done they have written the formula in terms of p's okay they have written the formula in terms of p's now if i just use a's and i write the formula in terms of a that's what i did last term for you guys on the left i put up a bunch special separate bunch of proofs uh, a separate bunch of uh, calculations right so you can just so when you are the reason i'm telling you this as i said it might seem like much ado about nothing but this contains an important lesson in how you think about designing a, this is also program okay what is a spreadsheet a spreadsheet is just a programming environment okay you got a bunch of subroutines i told you what subroutines earlier okay all these things are subroutines when i write irr i am actually calling a subroutine 
because the program has already been the software has already been the spreadsheet has already knows what an IRR is as soon as you write equal to IRR the system knows that I'm going to execute this subroutine right are you following you have to think about you have to start thinking about how systems works how techno how systems work how technology works right so as soon as you start writing equal to IRR the system is already calling knows that it has to ex execute the subroutine so it is asking you for the inputs that I need to execute the subroutine that's why it asks you in the structured format these are the inputs you can't just write equal to IRR in five years or something you have to write it in a particular way you have to fill in those arguments in a particular way that's what system requires but essentially what it's doing is it will then go and execute that subroutine with your inputs okay so it is also a programming environment but it is a way of working largely you are working with subroutines because all these formulae are like subroutines right so in the programming when you're designing this thing when it is also a program so you have to take a systemic view what will make this whole operation more efficient so therefore a is better than just uh, than both p and a this is clear to everyone you don't have to agree just because i've done it this way but you should be able to see that it's more efficient because total number of keystrokes is reduced right okay so then therefore basically so that's the important lesson that i wanted to give you okay so much ado about nothing but uh, we'll go on to but these things are important because i think the, these kinds of ways of looking at problems are important so it's important for you guys to be aware of things like um so this ratio density connection between all these important ideas and then it goes to lean computer code by now you know what i mean by lean right lean computer code okay if you can do the same uh, text because later on you will have to do debugging okay so this stuff is in your notes i put all these things in your notes and your job is to go and do further investigation on ideas like occam's razor these are very important ideas which will help you in many ways in life so lean computer code again you have to think about uh, how many lines of code am i using to get a job done all right so we go on to our now we go on to our next point on um, so whatever we discussed yesterday we completed that idea about vega just quickly recapping we had vega versus expiration oh that chart should actually be here this chart okay where is the chart didn't i okay i didn't put the chart here but you can actually get it from that website as well but i'll try to put the chart here if we can we can close attendance Okay, I'll put it later on, don't worry. There are 18 instances, 16 instances of Vega. So we'll put it later on. You can find the chart here also anyway. All right, that particular chart that I showed you that longer dated options have higher Vega, okay? So remember that one more thing, if we just click it up, let's see, maybe this side is also blocked. So I just wanted to show you this picture okay which is not big enough at this point all right so obviously here what it shows you is the longer dated options have higher vega and since i've shown you i've told you to buy to lean toward longer dated options when you're a buyer of options okay because shorter dated so that decision is mainly driven by the uh, the consideration of theta because if you buy shorter dated options the theta will be very high so you don't have much time for the underlying asset view or the eyeball view to play out because the option is losing value dramatically okay so that's why you're kind of almost constrained you have no no option but to go longer dated when you're going for uh, purchase of options whether it's calls or puts okay so the vega of longer dated options is greater okay but obviously this is a double-edged sword because why is this a double-edged sword because uh, because the option so if your vega view is if your eyeball view is correct okay if your eyeball view here like yesterday i was giving you an eyeball view on microsoft options that let's say my view is that this goes back up to 40 42 levels okay now if this view turns out to be correct buying longer dated options has another additional benefit which is that it the vega of longer dated options is much higher okay so i'll get a double whammy benefit okay that i not only avoid the high theta of a short dated option but i'm also because longer dated options have higher vega and my IY view has turned out to be correct. Therefore, I get more benefit from the purchase of the longer dated option than I would have got if I had bought a shorter dated option. Okay. So Vega, remember, is just the 
sensitivity of the option price to the changes in the I wall. So what is the Vega measuring this? You have to read from the book. Where is that option price? Mm. I opened it now. Maybe I closed now. That also might be blocked. Everything is blocked. Okay. Never mind. You saw that, right? You saw that. No, won't even load from the yeah. Okay, guys. So uh, now, so what was I saying? So so longer dated option. The, the there's an extra benefit because it has more sensitivity. The Vega. I was talking about the Vega, right? So Vega is measuring nothing but the sensitivity of the option price. You saw that the option price has many um, uh, uh, in many inputs and one output, the OVM, huh? and uh, so then. Uh, so, if you, uh, the Vega is the sensitivity of the option price to changing the vol input, okay? So, changing the vol input. Is this clear to everybody? We've already discussed it. So, you need to basically, I'm sure if I ask people, everybody would not be able to answer clearly what Vega is, okay? That is my suspicion, okay? So, um, so please make sure that these concepts are thoroughly internalized. You have to read the book. I refer to certain parts of the textbook. You have to read the book, you have to read the notes, you have to watch the video, experiment for yourself. Also, you have to you have the links for the option price calculator. You have to experiment for yourself. You have to tinker with it yourself. Only then does it get internalized. Okay. All right. So, but then also that understand that this is actually a double-edged sword because have you heard this expression, double-edged sword? Yeah. Okay, good. So we say that leverage is a double edge in the context of finance we uh, say that leverage is a double edged sword because it when you're right it works it makes a lot more money for you okay because if I can buy something by just putting up 5% of the value okay and uh, then the price of that asset moves up then I make a real big killing in terms of absolute profit and the return on my 5% uh, margin that I put up uh, but when it goes against me then the margin is very quickly wiped out so we say that leverage is a double-edged sword okay so similarly uh, this is also a double-edged sword because because the longer dated option has higher Vega if your eyeball view turns out to be wrong okay so if your eyeball view turns out to be wrong in this sense here if I buy the options here and then the eyeballs drop okay and the eyeballs drop to say 15% then my option my longer dated option has lost much more value compared to a shorter dated option if you ignore the impact of theta because when you're looking at these sensitivities these are all basically citrus on a citrus paribus basis so when you calculate the vega you're assuming that everything else remains the same everything else remaining the same the change in the value of the option for a change in the for unit change in the uh, wall input into the OVM this is clear okay so so that therefore this is also a double-edged sword so bottom line is the reason you end up buying long dated option is really not because of the Vega okay but if your view is right you'll get an additional benefit because longer dated options have higher Vega the reason you are basically forced to buy longer dated options is because you don't want to get hit by the high theta of short dated options right is this clear okay all right so this is our next point okay so this you can guys you guys can click and open this and see check the look at the video uh, the proof okay sorry look at the uh, the picture and internalize that in your head okay yeah this means that Vega is only there to help us check if we are assuming it in the correct direction or not Rather than because uh, we are only checking the eyeball and uh, that uh, expired uh, expiration period of the uh, option. No, no, sorry, I'm not able to get your question. Uh, repeat the question. Give him the mic. Let's use the mic. Let's make use of the mic. Meantime, let me try and. Um, Okay, go ahead. Tell me what the question is. Yeah, what is your question? Uh, sir, we had a decision problem like uh, which option uh, we should go for where we are checking the eyeball and uh, uh, I can. Yeah, your voice is not coming through the mic in the way that mine is coming through the mic. Okay, sir. Yeah, now it's better. Now it's better. 
Yeah, yeah, we have the list of decision problems here. So what are you saying? Sir, Let me ask. Sir, uh, third one, whether to buy or sell options, we are checking the I one value. No, you are not checking the I one value. You are taking a view. I view. I view. Yes, you are looking at the I one chart and taking an I one view. Yes, sir. So uh, we are assuming something. So we are having Vega to cross check our assumption if we are uh, assuming it is the correct way or not. Because right now, like you said, that Vega is not that important uh, to check which option to buy or not. Yeah, because I'm, what I'm telling, what I'm saying is that the decision to buy longer dated option is basically almost, uh, I mean, a Hobson's choice. You know what the Hobson's choice expression means, right? Are you familiar with Hobson's choice? No, so Hobson's choice means no choice. Okay. <laughs> so this is a, so this is a Hobson's choice because essentially the reason I'm forced to buy longer dated options is because I don't want to get hit with the short dated options, uh, the high theta if I buy a short dated option. Okay, I'll have a high theta. So I don't want to get hit by that. So I have almost no choice but to go longer dated when I'm a buyer of options. This is clear. This is how the decision is made. Then we are noticing that having taken this kind of, having, having been forced into this kind of decision, then we are noticing because we have to be aware, aware of the behavior of Vega as well, right? Some part of your basic training and options trading has to be also, uh, has to also include this idea that longer dated options have higher Vega. This as we say, pitch, a picture says a, a thousand words. If you internalize this picture, you will understand that longer dated options have higher Vega. Okay. So now, uh, having been forced into buying only longer dated options we are just taking note of the fact that longer dated options have higher vega so if my eyeball view is correct so this is kind of like leverage being a double-edged sword if my eyeball view is correct i will that have the fact that i bought a longer dated option has an additional benefit because the vega is also higher than a shorter dated option so and what is vega vega is the sensitivity of the option price to changes in the ball input okay into the OVM right so if therefore uh, the option price will also respond more dramatically to a change in the eyeball in my favor so what I'm talking about here is I took a bullish view on the eyeball for Microsoft options okay and then if the price ball actually turns out to view turns out to be correct and it shoots up to 42 percent the eyeball what will happen Cetrus Paribus the Microsoft option prices will increase or decrease is my question clear yeah so if I if I uh, if I buy uh, Microsoft options okay let's say I forget about calls and buy let's say I buy both I both uh, buy both calls and puts okay and then after, when I buy it if the the eyeball is 28 28 percent and after I buy it the next day itself for the sake of simplicity we take an extreme example for the sake of simply uh, so the next day itself the eyeball shoots up to 42 now my options are they worth more or are they worth less they're worth less uh, they're more worth more right okay this is clear because Vega is basically positive for long options position so whenever you are um, uh, the eyeball goes up the option price will also go up okay please uh, please make sure your understanding of eyeball is correct I've given you two ball, two ways to look at eyeball please make sure you go and re revise those because if your concepts are not clear you'll, you'll have a problem later on okay that the eyeball is only basically uh, the eyeball is arrived at remember what we discussed which Tanya pointed out that we do the same exercise in, I, in IRR calculations you have to remember how we calculated eyeball we saw that the market price is showing say 3.02 or something but when I input my uh, estimate of the wall to the into the OVM the price is coming out to be maybe 2.5 okay so this is not good enough so basically what are we asking when we are calculating eyeball this is what you have to remember really what you have to understand as a concept that all right in calculating eyeball you are asking yourself you look at the market price and you have an OVM in your hand okay and you enter certain values into the OVM including a particular wall wall input okay and let's say you have entered a wall input of 25% and you get, get a price of 2.5 
but when you look at the market you see that we are not able to do this exercise by looking at uh, maybe we can do something here eye volatility so i have that's why i make sure i open all the sites before i come here okay all the sites that i need okay where do they show any option prices okay now i don't want to move this from here from this view also they do show option prices but here they are showing only balls okay they're only showing a, a balls and that's it okay never mind okay so another eyeball chart all right so what are we doing please remember this concept of eyeball revise it once again so what are we doing and we we ask ourselves this question that if the market price is 3.02 and with my wall input of 25% into the OVM i'm getting a market price uh, i'm getting a fair value remember OVM gives you fair value okay i'm getting a fair value of um, 2.5 okay now i ask myself okay so it, that's a legitimate question to ask like what i if the market so the question is very specific if the market were also using the same ovm that i am using and setting the price equal to fair value so understand two steps one is market is using the same ovm that i am using okay the same model okay and then the market is setting the market price as equal to fair value okay second step if those two were true then what wall input is the market entering into the ovm to come up with that price is yeah. the point clear yes. let's do this one more time although i've done it once uh, i've done it before but let's do it one more time here i have okay i'm going to try these things are so important actually that uh, okay let's let's uh, let's not uh, reboot uh, you know let's not try and open that again through this let's switch it back on i'll just write it once again i'll write it once again this is another maybe i've not uh, i have explained it in this way but let's do it one more time because we make sure we we have to make sure that uh, so before we come to this understanding of vega okay we were discussing vega all right and then we came once again to the eyeball view okay so this is uh, there are different ways of looking at eyeball this is the uh, the first this is kind of the um, uh, i don't know how i listed it okay this is i think i would have listed it as a mechanical let's go back in your notes and look at it i'll just in that case i'll just amend your notes if i need to at all okay so let's go back to the so so this chart now i've given you strictly speaking only true for at the money options okay for in the money options okay there, there's a little bit of a difference in the curve a little bit towards the end but uh, this start with this as a working strategy that uh, you know you want to be buying you want to be selling shorter dated options and you want to be buying longer dated options so in giving you a structure i have given you i have made certain simplifying assumptions because i want to start you because option trading is quite complicated so i wanted to start you guys out, out with a structure okay so therefore there are certain simplifying elements and obviously when you start looking at at the money versus out of the money in the money there are all kinds of variations okay so that will get very complicated yeah i'm just coming to your uh, question i'm just trying to find uh, yeah what is your question you tell me the question so yesterday uh, when you open the option uh, value calculator it was uh, giving uh, a similar same vega value for both call and put options so where, where to differ which one to uh, go for either to go for call option or put options no that is decided by a different uh, you don't decide that by looking at the vega But sir, you, you said that higher the vega for a longer dated option means we higher. Uh, we'll be getting a different uh, eyeball view. No, no, no. Higher vega has nothing to do with the eyeball view. Higher, I, I would never have said that. The higher vega is just a property of longer term options. If you have an option which has which you can see in that chart, right? That this is the chart which shows you these are the properties. Okay. Yeah. 
so 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 it's okay there's no problem that's why that's why you should ask questions so you can clarify because some first time when you hear something you may have a different impression in your head okay which is not the right impression that's why you have to ask questions so you clarify that impression okay so that's be let's be clear about that uh, i would never have said that that eyeball view is based on higher vega for longer data option eyeball view is based on essentially uh, you really can't use fundamental analysis it's based on a technical analysis of the eyeball chart okay so you look at the eyeball chart look at the trends and you take a view on which way eyeball is headed okay is it going to go up or is it going to go down okay so that's what the eyeball view is based on and that puts you into one camp if you are bullish on the eyeball then it puts you into the buyer of options camp and if you're bearish on eyeball it puts you into the seller of options camp yes okay so just quickly to recap your decision problems the other important decision there are many other decision problems but the second important decision problem is whether now that you're a buyer let's say you're a buyer of options should you buy calls or should you buy puts and that is decided by taking a view on the underlying asset so here Microsoft that we have already discussed okay so now that i have taken a bullish view on eyeball that makes me a buyer of options second important decision problem is should i now buy calls or buy puts so for that to answer that question i take a view on the underlying asset price microsoft i take a view on this and let's say i'm bullish on this you could also be bearish but sir, let me finish this okay let's just let, and so i take a let's say if i'm bullish on this also i take a view on the underlying asset and i'm bullish on this that solves my problem whether to buy calls or puts right so i should be a buyer of if my view is bullish then i should be a buyer of what Somebody said put. Who said put? Rajan. Okay. So, uh, so put. No calls. Yes, Gurani. If I'm now, let's let's ask you. Let's ask you. If I'm first decision problem is clear. Should I be a buyer of options or should I be a seller of options? Okay. So I take a view on the eyeball chart. Okay, and this is just like a sofa. You have to look at it like a sofa. Okay, and so if you are bullish on the eyeball chart, then you buy. Then you are a buyer of options. You still have another problem at least left. Should I be a buyer of calls or puts? For that, we take a view on the underlying asset price. Which way is this going to go? Is it going to go up or down? So let's say here I decide that it's going to go up. Then I should be a. Should I be a buyer of calls or a buyer of puts? One minute. Let him answer. Is my question clear? Sir, uh, I would like to refer the theta value for that one. One minute, one minute. Do you answer my question first? <laughs> Is my question clear? Yes. I took a view. I took a view on the eyeballs, and I decided that I'm going to be a buyer of options because I'm bullish on the eyeballs. Yes, sir. Now I have another big important problem to deal with. Should I be a buyer of calls or puts? Okay. So for that, the rule is that I take a view on the underlying asset and I come to the decision. Yes. Sir. Okay. So I took a view and I'm let's say I'm bullish on the underlying asset. Yes. Sir. So now answer my question. Should should I now be a buyer of calls or should I be a buyer of puts? Sir, sir, I would say call, but once I would like. To now, okay, that's fine. That's now, now move on to the next sir, step. Sir, I would yeah. like to go and check the value for theta as well because in the calculator. Yeah. So we'll come to that. The theta at this stage you don't need the theta. At this stage, you don't need the theta. The theta is required when you are looking at the question of one minute, guys. When we are uh, so uh, the theta at this stage, you don't. So that's what you should be clear about because don't, you don't want to overcomplicate your life. The reason I've given you this kind of structure by making certain simplifying assumptions is that I don't want you to overcomplicate your life. Okay, you are going through decisions one by one. Okay, so first you decide whether you want to be a buyer of options or seller. You decided that. Then you just that you had a problem. Should I be a buyer of calls or puts? You have decided that to buy calls because your view on the underlying asset is bullish. Okay, your view is that Microsoft is going up. Okay, now which is the same by the way. You should be watching uh, RBC. Who's RBC? <laughs> yes. Somebody said Royal Bank. Of <laughs> Royal Bank of Canada. <laughs> Royal Bank of Canada. Okay. Red blood cells. RBC. Oh, RBC is red blood cells. Okay. But in this context, obviously, when you see a headline like RBC raises Microsoft target, this is Royal Bank of Canada. So their securities division. So Royal Bank of Canada is the most important uh, Canadian bank. Okay. So their securities division has obviously taken a view. Their technology analyst has taken a view 
uh, that uh, Microsoft uh, is uh, more bullish than he initially thought. So this is one of the events that you will see happening in the markets regularly if you are following the markets. That various analysts and brokerages will come out, uh, various analysts working for different brokerages will come out and either raise their target or ro lower their target. So they are raising their target price in this case. Okay. So, so as I said, so bullish uh, RBC is also bullish on Microsoft. Okay. So now what is your, the point you are talking about theta? That theta question comes up only when you are looking at that next decision problem that now that I'm going to be a buyer of calls, which what is the decision problem that we are talking about now where theta becomes important? Expiry which expiry date? That's the decision problem, right? When you're talking about that, now you have to decide that as well, which expi expiry date. That's when the concept of theta comes into play, that you know that shorter dated options have very high theta. So if you're going to be a buyer, in this case, I'm going to be a buyer of calls, then I should not be into the short dates because they will have very high theta, okay? And my option will lose value very fast every day okay so it will lose substantial amounts of value every day so therefore since i'm going to be a buyer of options okay as a result of solving the other decision problem the earlier decision problems i should put myself into the longer maturities is this clear okay right so now does that clarify all your doubts any other any confusion so uh, the last one regarding uh, the difference between the value of the theta value of call and put option one minute let me just try and see if my my uh have you guys heard of this uh, company called we work yeah some people have heard but uh, there's a very big valuation lesson in we work okay do you know what the valuation of we work was and these are actually we work is not yet public so these are p every time you get a p valuation like you heard that swiggy has become a unicorn where do these what is the event that is triggering these uh, these public releases of the valuation information can you tell me why 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 are we coming to why are we coming to know about this like on what basis are people saying that swiggy is now a unicorn you know what a unicorn is Yes. Yes. Who? One minute. Let Burma speak. Burma doesn't speak much. Yes. Correct. Okay. So a, a unicorn in the current uh, you know, environment. The uh, the uh, the definition of a unicorn is a startup which has and uh, you have to be more specific. It's a uh, private company. Okay, so typically we don't because uh, the public company valuation is already known. It's a public. It's a private company company okay typically a startup which is uh, worth more than a billion dollars okay so there are many many unicorns around the world now so the reason that we come to know so the question that I was asking you is the reason that we come to know about these valuations that we work was worth 47 billion in, in January of 2019 okay and now it's worth uh, eight and now they are talking about eight billion valuation so the reason we come to know is that some PE or venture capital firm PE you know what is PE? Private. private equity. Okay, so some private equity or VC firm puts money into the company. Okay, so that's how we came to know that Swiggy is worth because there is a funding round. Okay, so you have all these Series A, Series B funding. Okay, you have these funding rounds. So some funding, some people like in January we came to know because SoftBank put in money into um, into WeWork, and that time it was they valued it at 47 billion. Okay, based on the the uh, stake that they bought. Okay, and the amount of money. So obviously you work it out. If somebody is buying, paying ten rupees to buy a ten percent stake in the company, then the company is worth ten a hundred rupees, right? So that's how they work it out. Okay, so the, so the, the the trigger the question that I was asking you is, what is the why do we come to know? Because some guy has put in money. Okay, so this is the point that we were discussing. So, so uh, on this on this video, I'll, I'll share this with you. Watch the first part of the video. We work is a classic lesson in valuation. Okay, because just imagine this is what I mean by valuation being subjective and see how unpredictable things are. In Jan of 2019, we work was worth. worth uh, if you go back here to the uh, initial part of the video, is I think where we work is. Yeah. This part you can watch this. All right, so you can that is that is a far cry from the forty-six. Yeah. Watch this.
I'll just play this for a while. I'm Taylor Brace in San Francisco. Francisco. This, this is Wimper Technology. Technology. Coming up Coming in the next hour, next hour lowering, lowering expectations. expectations. Soft Bank puts together a rescue, rescue plan for Weaver that may value over $100 million. million. Soft Bank Soft is investing in Weaver to provide a safe and secure way to live for life. Soft Bank Soft 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 Soft
okay because we know everybody knows what when christmas is right it's not the same so understand that it's not the same kind of discussion question is this clear okay so we had a little bit of a digression from the rbc uh, so in our class we have a lot of digressions because i i specialize in digressions okay so uh, but hopefully you can understand uh, the um, what we have discussed in this digression right that um, uh, the concept of valuation you can listen to this so i'm going to put this um, you should put uh, you should actually be listening to all of this stuff you can learn a lot actually about uh, how we'll put it into today's notes so there's a discussion about uh, so i'm putting this into this this is a lesson in valuation and the subjectivity of valuation the first part of the video what is happening why is it like this anyway never mind we'll just put it here okay so for bega and aibol i was trying to go back okay gulati is your problem solved not yet solved okay, okay. No, now now i'm on, on my uh, geo5 it seems to be working so let's come so this is one of the ways so this is the way that uh, so sometimes you have to deal with this situation where somebody one of your batchmates may not be clear about certain things okay so we will say but you may have understood that thing but in that case you have to be patient and wait and then until that question has been clarified hmm? so you should not make fun of him that you know yeah, so because this is because it depends on how you teach the course you can uh, you can also have this view that you know i'm going to teach like some one of our teachers was you say maine to pada diya but what has this student understood uh, so the objective of teaching is to me the objective is that everybody who is interested some has some interest should be clear about what they what has been discussed and the, the only reason you come to class is for the benefit of asking questions otherwise there's no need to come to class you can just watch the videos from home right so the only reason that you come to class is for questions so therefore questions are now you see i talked about my geo5 now it's gone for no now that also won't open i should does anyone have a data cable oh it still won't really affect us you have a date anyone has a data cable so again two people have gone out together or what two people have gone out together okay ritesh just watch we don't have much time but just make sure that not more than one person goes okay now uh, this again is not working anyone anybody with the data cable if we can plug one of the problems okay we got it we got it okay so we got our the option price uh, side opened up okay now tell me what is the question that you have so like uh, here we are having uh, minus 0.05 theta value for call option don't say here we are having here we have so here we have uh, uh, like uh, minus 0.05 value for call option and minus 0.04 uh, for put option and according to the uh, view on the underlying asset we decided to go for the call option but no 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 one minute okay your statements independently are correct but the way you have uh, uttered them it seems to me that you think that the first one is because of the second uh, or the second one is before the, because of the first one that we decided to go for call options because the call options have lower theta that's what you seem to be saying no sir we decided to go for call option because of uh, because we had a, a bullish view on the underlying asset yeah but looking at the uh, theta value call option is having a slightly higher uh, Value okay i understand now i understand what you're saying now i understand what you're saying so there is a logic to his question okay it also shows that he is thinking about the problem and applying his mind tinkering with the software and uh, so the, your question is a good question okay so it's a valid question so what he is saying is that although we decided because we were bullish or bullish on the underlying asset we decided to buy a call option not a put option but he is saying but look at this the call option has a higher theta than a put option okay 
so maybe you should buy a put option that's the question that you're asking very good question very valid question but that's not what we are uh, the the dominant consideration okay that we are applying okay here again you have some subjectivity you can also set up a trading system for options where you choose to buy uh, the one which has the lower theta okay but uh, the way we do it is the the conventional theory is that because the underlying price will have a much bigger impact on the uh, option profitability okay the movement of the underlying asset okay so therefore the way we have set up the theory is that the decision as to whether to buy a call option or a put option is made on the basis of the view of the underlying asset the view on the underlying asset okay so your question is valid but it's just a matter of prioritization okay because as you can see clearly that these two rules the the decision rule that gulati is suggesting that you buy the option which has the lower theta okay that would lead to a different decision in certain situations than the decision rule which i have given you which is to buy once you're a buyer of options to buy call options if you're bullish on the underlying asset yeah and to buy put options if you're bearish on the underlying asset this is clear so the two decision rules have a different i just come to you the two decision rules come out with different conclusions so therefore there is a question of prioritization there has to be a hierarchy okay just like if you go back to all this stakeholder theory you know you talk about shareholders versus stakeholders you heard this debate yeah. right stakeholders okay everybody so uh, there's in that debate somebody even said that even terrorists are stakeholders so you have to take care of terrorists are also stakeholders okay so but there's a conflict so there needs to be a hierarchy okay uh, and so therefore we are choosing the hierarchy that i've given you i'm saying that rule is more important okay now let's take sakshi's question yeah Sir, give her the mic give her the mic okay. yeah Sir, you said that the theta call. Your voice is not coming through the mic, even though you are on the first bit. You said that theta call option, it is uh, greater than the put option. You're, don't talk. Don't talk when somebody is here. Yeah, what are you saying? Sir, you said that theta call option is greater than put option. No, oh. we are noticing this here. We are noticing this here. Okay. so uh, in this particular case that we are noticing this here we can actually there is a see there is one difference between call options and put options in the sense that the put option has because the stock the underlying in the case of stocks at least okay and most of the underlying can only go to zero whereas on the upside there is uh, unlimited potential in the case of call options but what is your saying so so in this case let's say we have theta of call option is higher than theta of put option so what are you going what is your next step from there what are you saying from there So, sir, you have said that uh, according to Karthik, uh, you said that the theta of call option. Use use the mic. Yeah, theta of call option. Yeah. Theta of call option. It is. Uh, this is not coming through the. <laughs> voice has to come through the mic. This is part of your. No, this is part of your learning. Also, when you when you are speaking with the mic, you should voice, you should be able to detect whether your voice is coming through the mic. Yeah, go ahead. Sir, so in this case, the uh, put option theta it is greater than the call option, but we said it reverse. No, which is greater? Which one has a higher theta? In this case, what we are looking at on the screen, which one has a higher theta? Put option has a higher theta. Okay, so you don't have to take this when we say higher here. When we say higher here, we are not. One sec, guys. One minute. Sir, this was the same doubt I had earlier. Like according to us. One minute. No, one minute. Okay, guys. One sec, one sec. Don't don't make fun of him. Okay. Sir, sir, I ask this question again. You said that if we look at take a mathematical number line way, put as a hard data value. But if we uh, look at in the financial terms. Call option is uh, losing value of around five cents. Okay, so you did ask. Okay, I forgot about that. So I did mention the number line concept. I did mention the so Guladi. I did mention the number line concept. Okay, good. I forgot on that. So it's when we say higher theta because first. in order to understand this the, this depiction in the model when the model outputs come out okay you have to understand what is theta the theta is trying to that's why you notice both calls and puts have negative theta 
okay so these sensitivities are for I've told you many times these are for long option positions okay this is telling you what will happen uh, if you do a sensitivity in, uh, if there is a change in one of these inputs without any change with Cetrus Paribus there's a change in one of the inputs what will happen what will be the impact on the option price so you notice these are for long option positions and you notice both calls and puts have negative theta so the first thing forget about the magnitude let's just look at the sign so the first thing that this thing is telling you is that if you buy calls or whether you buy whether you buy calls or puts okay Cedris Paribus with the passage of time both will lose value every day okay so this is showing you the change the sign of the change in the option price or the fair value of the option for a change in the uh, input for, for unit change in the input in this case we are talking time as an input time to expiration which only moves in one direction so one day less in the option where one day less if the after you buy the option one day elapses and nothing moves okay if you buy the option one day elapses nothing moves then the option will lose value the call option will lose 0 0.05 in value lose comes from the minus sign okay and the put option will lose 0 0.04 in value this is clear so are you for is this clear? make sure I'm not sure everybody has understood this clearly okay so uh, so Gulati is correct that it is actually the call option has higher theta okay because when we are talking about higher first you have to be clear about what theta is theta is the uh, theta the number theta is showing you the loss of value in the option for one day uh, you know less than the time to expiration so basically pass passage of one day okay so therefore how much value will the call option lose that is given by minus 0 0.054 and how much will be how much will value will the put option lose is minus 0 0.04 okay so this is not in the net in the number line sense you are correct if you take it from a number line sense obviously the put option has higher theta it's a higher magnitude it's closer to zero on the number line okay in, on the negative side okay so but this is further away from zero okay so therefore the magnitude it is uh, lower okay it's an absolute magnitude okay but here the sign is also relevant because your question is which option will lose more value for one day of uh, time passing for one day of time passing which option is going to lose more value is that clear now to everybody that's called okay so it is not in the absolute magnitude sense okay so this is clear yeah so the reason you were highlighting it is uh, because of just to point this out basically okay okay I had also actually forgotten that we had uh, discussed the number line concept okay so we are moving a little slowly but doesn't matter that's why we we want to encourage questions question because the whole point of people coming to class is that they have the ability to ask questions otherwise there's no need no need to come to class okay so what do we have so we had a little discussion on the we work valuation I think these are important this is how you connect to, to what you what is happening in the real world okay so uh, Vega and I evolved I wanted to go back to the discussion of Vega that I had given uh, so because I think you need to understand this also where is that uh, part on uh, yeah so yeah we are talking about this mechanical answer okay to understand eyeball we are talking about this mechanical answer I just want to make it clear to you okay that I think I need to discuss this um, part as well let's so let's have this discussion okay so now we are going into the eyeball discussion so the question is so there are I'm going to teach you three ways to look at eyeball okay and one is a mechanical way of looking at eyeball and there are two intuitive ways of understanding eyeball okay so the mechanical answer is also very important okay which is please understand this in terms of English language that uh, um, you know that we'll understand conceptually what it means okay so this is clear to everybody the eyeball is the ball input in the OVM which makes the OVM throw out a fair value for the option that is equal to the market price for the option is this clear we have already discussed this so this part is coming so later on and maybe I'll write it when the the connection comes back or have we opened everything then I'll try to go back to the uh, normal connection since we have opened everything but um, 
if we make any changes let's just go back to the novel we will not make any changes I think this what is clear is that my geo is even signal strength is even weaker than Not the test connection. connection. Mm. Alright, let's go back to this. So the only thing I was saying in the context of this is that uh, how are you being very clear because this is very important to understand mechanically at least also uh, what exactly is eyeball okay because you may be getting confused. So you have on the one hand you have the market price but the market is options are trading in the market and through buying and selling a price is always being determined okay. So then you have the price discovery process in the market you have option prices and then you have your fair value model which you pun pump punch a value into your fair value model and you come up with an output okay. So let's say here we have this is the fair value model and I have a vol input of 25 and then I see that my price is 3.02 let's just call it 3 and let's say that the market price for the same option same parameter the market price for the same option is showing as five dollars okay so now what do I do I ask myself this question okay so let's say the uh, in this option price uh, let me put it here then we'll discuss the other parts Okay, so the question that I'm asking is this, that let's say we have, we have a market price for option as one, okay, we have the market price option and then we have actually uh, the uh, OVM output for fair value of option. Okay. We have these two different things. They need not be the same. Okay, because they are coming. They are being derived from different processes. They need not be the same because market price is coming out of constant <coughs> buying and selling pressure in the market, and OVM uh, output is coming from the user entering certain values into the OVM. So the result may not be the same. Okay. So we have this. All this stuff is in your notes itself. Okay. So uh, you don't have to write this, but just make sure you understand this once again mechanically. So you have these two things. So now I do this my, my I do this uh, second one okay I do the OVM output for the fair value of the option now according to me the fair value of the option is uh, here the big unknown is everything else is known the big unknown is the ball input nobody knows what the ball input this is the future this is the future in, uh, you know input that the model is asking for okay just like in your CAPM cost of equity model what the model is asking for is what is the expected return uh, what is the expected uh, what is the equity risk premium expected to be in the future for the period for which you are doing this cost of equity calculation that is the question the model is asking okay and we are answering that by taking some last 20 years equity risk premium or last 40 years or something but you realize how wrong that is because just because it has been so for the last average 20 years that doesn't mean that it should be the same for the future so all these things you have to be aware of when you're using models okay where we are making all kinds of conceptual errors but everybody is doing it so it's a big happy family so you know it goes on all right so here the big question mark is the ball input nobody knows this is meant to be the model expects this to be a forward-looking estimate of the wall that will happen in the underlying asset the volatility of the underlying asset price it's a future it's an estimate for the future okay which requires to be which is required to be put into the OVM okay so I I put it in as 25 because according to me it should be 25 okay this is one more thing that you should guy you guys should think of remember yesterday we were talking about models and when you evaluate models you have to think about whether the en uh, endogenous variable is something that is observable or is it some kind of nebulous concept like what should the cost of equity be like a normative concept like I told you if you have an endogenous variable where endogenous variable is rainfall at gate number two that's an observable endogenous variable so you can test that model because you every day you're saying there'll be two centimeters of rain now it, I'm getting only half a centimeter that means your model doesn't seem to be very good so you can test that model objectively these things are also important so here you have another thing that you should no notice when you're looking at models is here the vol input the vol is what as an exogenous variable or endogenous let's ask somebody Puneet in this OVM okay the fair value model for options in this the vol is it an exogenous variable or an endogenous variable exogenous okay Shivam you agree with him yes, sir. okay good 
so it's an exogenous variable okay now notice what this is mm -hmm. normally what I would expect I mean this is my I'm showing my normative preferences so I'm showing my bias but what I would want in a model is if you are let's say you're modeling say next quarter's consumer spending okay I would prefer to have my exogenous variables clearly observable so you model next quarter's uh, con uh, consumer spending as a function of maybe this quarter's uh, inflation or, or the previous quarter's inflation previous quarter's household income previous quarter's unemployment rate because all those figures are known to me right you understand what I'm saying known versus forecast values now we're talking about one more aspect of models which is when you're evaluating models exogenous variables are they known or are they forecasts right because the model itself the endogenous variable is obviously a forecast okay it may be a forecast of an objectively observable quantity like rainfall at gate number two or it may be some nebulous quantity like what should the cost of equity be right okay but at, at least the now when you're focusing on exogenous variables you should also ask yourself this question of are these observable like if I model next quarter's consumer spending as a function of last quarter's unemployment last quarter's household income last quarter's inflation here all the exogenous variables are known is that clear okay so when you're evaluating models also watch out for this are the exogenous variables known quantities or are they themselves forecasts okay so in your Gordon growth model exogenous variables are they known or are they forecasts <coughs> known both one is known constant dividend rate growth rate is a forecast okay so watch out for all these things okay that's basically what makes a mod tends to make a model more subjective because your input itself is a forecast okay so here is another example of a model the famed option pricing model okay which really is an option valuation model okay so here the vol input is always a forecast you're deriving a fair value based on your estimate of the vol okay so you come up with a fair value of 3.03 .03, let's call it 3 but the market price for the very same option which is trading in the market you find that the market price is 5 okay so we have this situation market price of option this is only uh, this is equal to 5 I can't see anything see for your convenience I am straining my eyes okay to uh, OVM output for fair value of option is 3 okay everybody understand the example we're talking about okay I observe that the market price is 3 so now comes the question how exactly would you understand I, I, I evolve now comes the question if the market were uh, also using now we split the question into two parts if one um, okay the market were also using the same OVM as I am using okay and two okay that two is not the same case setting setting price equal to fair value or let's make it even more specific always setting price always setting price equal to fair value if these two are true then what input is the market uh, entering or what value is what value is the market entering into the OVM for the ball input. Is this point clear? Is this clear now? This is how you should understand mechanically. Make sure you revise it properly. So what am I doing? I look at this, my bear value is 3, but when I look at the market price is 5. Now I ask myself this question, if the market were using the same OVM that I am using, 1. Number 2, if the market were always setting price equal to fair value according to this OVM, then what must be true, what must be true for the 
vol input that the market is entering uh, the the what must be true for the value that the market is entering in this vol input cell it is entering something other than 25 obviously because 25 gives a fair value of uh, 3 and the market is trading at 5 so if we assume that market is all using the same model number 1 and number 2 always setting price equal to fair value then what vol input is the market using can we conclude what can we conclude what we do for the same exercise as we learned okay same as IRR we can't find this analytically we have to go do trial and error so the market vol input is higher or lower than what I have higher okay because in order to go from a value of 3 to for the option price to a value of 5 okay uh, everything else being the same you need a much higher ball input okay so this is what eyeball is and this is how eyeball so these eyeball charts that you're looking at how are these eyeball charts calculate how is each value this is a this is a time series chart or a or cross sectional data chart the eyeball time series chart okay how is this plotted every day you take a look at average options of microsoft average prices of microsoft options okay you know all the other parameters the only thing that's not known is the ball input okay and then you take your ovm and you make a first guess maybe the ball is 35 percent and then you see it doesn't come out to that price okay so you do this exercise every day and then you eventually converge to the uh, same the wall input that will give you the same uh, OBM output that is equal uh, as the market price that's the exercise you go through to ex to come out with this eyeball chart over time okay so this is what eyeball is essentially that's why we say now when you understood the mechanical part okay you can also understand the uh, first intuitive answer to what eyeball is eyeball is an index of option prices why do we say that because as you can see from the mechanical part higher eyeball means Cetris Paribus higher option prices yes higher eyeball means higher option prices okay so go through this and understand this because these concepts are a little slippery and you guys are encountering them for the first time so unless you internalize and the value of investing that time is that once you have mastered it conceptually then you will never forget it other than that if you just mug it up and try to do something in the exam then by next semester you have forgotten it so what is the point you're wasting your time right there must be some solid value addition from the program as a finance student you should have you should be totally proficient in all the important concepts that have been taught to you over the course otherwise the whole waste program is a waste of time for you right yes so already Galvin's responses are becoming more emphatic which means we are report re reaching the end of the class time okay so please remember to watch these programs regularly okay all right okay so anybody has any technical questions so any so please if anything we've learned one sec guys so if you have learned anything from if we have any if you have learned anything from today's class from Gulati's persistent questioning is that you should follow this example whenever you have any doubt you should ask a question it doesn't matter what other classmates think whether your question is smart or stupid or that's not important you are here to ask questions and clarify your doubts okay so make sure you everybody should take Gulati as the hero and uh, follow his example okay yeah okay all right okay guys anybody any technical questions no technical questions any problems with the trading project not not making enough money that's also a problem